This lecture will cover management on horse keeping, winter management, and common ailments are topics in this lecture. So with horse keeping, we're going to start with pasture. This is the easiest and simplest way to keep a horse. It is also the most natural. A horse's anatomy was designed for them to be on pasture 24 hours a day. They have a small stomach where they can ingest small amounts of food gradually over the course of the full day, therefore getting all the requirements of nutrients that they need. Uh, some things to think about are safety in the pasture. You need to think about what type of fencing you are going to use. Typically barbed wire is not ideal, however if your horse is trained to respect the barbed wire it's not a problem. You don't want your fencing to be down where they would try to jump it or step over it. You want it to be erect, upright, and solid. You also want your pasture to be free of hazards such as old farm equipment, um, glass, nails, anything like that that they could injure themselves on. Your stocking rates need to be compatible with the size of pasture that you have. If you have too many horses for that pasture, you're going to run out of feed and you may end up with horses fighting over the available feed. Not to mention the fact that eventually it will ruin your pasture, weeds will take over and the grass will cease to exist. Pasture mates need to be carefully considered in a pasture. If your horses do not get along together, you run the risk of a horse getting pinned in a corner or against the fence or in a herd where it's going to get hurt. Again, pasture, this is the easiest way to keep a horse. There's generally minimal labor. You should drag your pastures every now and again. And if you rotate your pastures, you should mow the tall grass left behind by your horses to keep it short and allow for even growing across your pasture. Other than that, maybe some irrigation and maybe some fence repair, but it is generally not a very labor intensive way of keeping your horse. Water, your horse needs to have access to clean water at all times and needs to have an ample supply. A creek or a ditch are good sources of water. Water tanks will need to be cleaned out often, but they are also a good source of water as well. A dry lot is a pen or a corral or a small paddock with, in which there is little to no grazing. Uh, some reasons for keeping your horse up in a dry lot. Maybe your horse is obese. This horse needs to have his nutrition restricted or his diet restricted or maybe you have a horse that does not get along with others and so he needs to stay out of the pastures. Maybe you have a horse that is injured and needs to stay up on smaller area. Those are all reasons to put your horse in a dry lot. Um, another reason might be you just simply don't have pasture. In a dry lot, the things to think about in or in for safety would be again your fences. They need to be solid, upright. Um, they need to be erect. There should not be any broken boards, barbed wire, or loose wire that a horse could get into. Again, if your horse is trained for barbed wire, this is generally not a problem. A lot of people use hot wire in a dry lot, dry lot to keep them off the fences. Stocking rate. Again, you need to have enough horse, enough room for the horses to move around. If you have 15 horses in a half acre dry lot, that is not going to work. Somebody will get injured. You must keep it to where they can move around, still getting some exercise, especially if your horse is obese. But generally a horse being a herd animal would like to have a friend or two in there with them. Uh, again, your lot mates should be getting along. They should not have to worry about anyone getting pinned in a corner and getting the crack, crap kicked out of them. This is a little more labor intensive. In order to control parasites, you will want to keep your dry lot free of manure. You would want to uh, make sure that it is not so compacted that your horse is standing on basically concrete. So you might need to drag it every once in a while. You would want to keep the weeds out of it as most weeds are toxic to horses. So maybe some spraying every once in a while would be included. Again, your horse needs access to 
an ample supply of clean, fresh water. Your tanks need to be cleaned out every couple of days, or if you have a large tank, at least once a week. Stall keeping is another way of keeping your horse. Uh, several reasons for keeping your horse in a stall. Maybe you use this horse every day and you, need, you don't want to have to go out to the pasture and catch him. Maybe you don't have pasture, you just simply have a stall and you ride your horse every day for and and he gets enough exercise. Uh, maybe your horse is injured and needs to be kept up in, a confi in confinement to heal. Um, maybe you have a broodmare you are watching for foaling and she needs to be kept up in a safe, comfortable place in order for her to foal. There are several reasons for keeping your horse in a stall. Again, your horse may be obese and needs his diet restricted. This would be another way to do that. And there are different things that you can do with all three of these horse keeping practices. You can rotate. For example, you can rotate your obese horse between a few hours of pasture to a dry lot where he would have to just suck it up and stand there all day with nothing to eat. But this is one way of restricting his diet. You could feed him hay in there, which is less carbohydrate rich, which will uh, reduce their weight eventually. You can also rotate between a stall and a dry lot or a stall and a pasture. If your horse needs to be restricted for diet reasons, maybe you have a broodmare, you want to keep her in a stall at night, out to pasture during the day. Um, lots of reasons for rotating between a stall, a dry lot, and a pasture. So for safety in a stall, we need to make sure that there are no sharp protrusions anywhere. This could be from your hooks for your water buckets to your feeders, nails and screws that are in the boards and doors. Those all need to be flush with the wall so that there is no sharp objects for your horse to injure themselves on. Um, this is the most labor intensive form of horse keeping. You must change the bedding at least once a week. It needs to be cleaned every day. And to be properly done, it needs to be cleaned twice a day, every day, to remove urine and feces that would cause foot problems in your horse, such as thrush. The horse will need to be fed at least twice a day, more preferably three to four times a day, again, taking into account his small stomach and his grazing uh, and anatomical features. Water will need to be changed every day, you need a fresh, ample supply. If you have an automatic water, this is great. However, you need to make sure that it is not electrocuting the horse if it has a heater in there. And you also need to make sure that it is running properly. If you do not have automatic water, again, you will need to fill and clean those water buckets every day. And exercising your horse is very important. If your horse is stalled, he needs to get exercise every day. Again, this is the most labor intensive for all of these reasons. For winter management, we're gonna cover several different things. Feeding. When you are feeding your horse in the winter time, there are things you need to take into consideration. One is body condition. If your horse is in ample body condition, that being a body condition score of a seven or above, you probably don't have to change your feeding for winter much in order to get them back down to a less than obese body condition. However, if your horse is in a poor body condition from one to a four, or in good body condition being a five, six, and a six and a half, then you would probably need to adapt your feeding schedule to the weather. Horses are built to have several layers for them during the winter time to help keep them warm. One of these layers is fat. If your horse is obese, obviously he has a fairly ample fat layer. This will keep him warm, which means you won't need to change your feeding schedule based on the weather. The other thing that a horse does is they grow a long winter coat. Now, the long winter coat works by trapping air in between the long hair shafts. If your horse is out in the wind or the rain or snow, this hair is getting wet and it is laying flat, not allowing for that air trappage to happen. 
If the hair is not able to trap the air, it is not working as a barrier against the cold and therefore your horse is feeling the cold. This is very important to note. All right, so when we're feeding, we need to take into account the temperature. For every five degrees below freezing, your horse's feed requirements increase by 10%. Now this is not a hard and fast number, it is approximate, but for teaching purposes I use the 10%. That means that if it is 30 degrees outside, then you probably can still feed the same as what you would feed your horse as if it was above freezing. However, if you get down to 22 degrees below zero, you must change your feed in order to accommodate for the temperature change. Otherwise, your horse is going to be using those fat stores in order to keep him warm and therefore decreasing his fat insulation layer, which will in time decrease his body condition. Wind chill and precipitation both add to the temperature. For instance, if you have a temperature of 20 degrees above zero, but you have a wind chill of 15 degrees, you must use that wind chill temperature in order for feeding your horse. The lowest temperature is that you need to pay attention to. If there is no wind, you can go by ambient temperature. If there is a hard wind blowing from the north that is cold, that hair is not going to be able to keep the air trapped in between those hair shafts because it's constantly moving and therefore your horse is going to feel every every degree of that 15 degrees rather than 20. I hope this makes sense. Precipitation again is going to make your hair shafts on your horses lay flat and therefore leading them to feel every bit of the ambient temperature. Again, for this, your horse's feed requirements must increase by approximately 10% for every 5 degrees below zero or below freezing, excuse me. So, other things to take into consideration for winter management are shelter. There are different types of shelter. There are natural shelters like canyon walls, ravines, trees, anything like that. You can build a lean-to, which is the second picture. Generally, a lean-to has two walls, one wall on each of the two sides that the wind generally comes from, and then you have a barn, which is typically three or four-sided. Now, when you take into consideration each types of these shelters, you have to think again about how the horse is built for winter. If you leave your horse out on pasture, with nothing but natural elements to shelter them from, yes, they can probably block the wind. However, if it is raining or snowing, the trees or canyons or ravines are not going to block your horse from getting wet. Once again, when your horse is wet, those hair shafts are not able to trap air and then your horse will feel the cold. A lean-to will block the wind but also keep the precipitation off your horse. In this way, he can still keep his air trapping uh, ability in his hair, plus get out of the wind. Now with a barn, obviously, this will block the wind on several sides. It has a cover to, de to keep them out of the precipitation, and therefore allowing the hair coat to do its job. Now, if you give your horse free choice to a shelter, are they going to use it all the time? No, probably not. A horse will use it when he starts to feel the cold. So giving them free choice to a shelter such as a lean-to or barn is a good idea because when the horse knows he's getting cold, he will use the shelter. A horse out on natural shelter, again, will use the trees, the ravines, or canyons as much as they possibly can. However, once they are wet, they still have no way to get away from the cold. <coughs> Not saying that it is not okay to use natural shelter for your horses, it is. And a lot of people still use only natural shelter for their horses. Another thing to take into account for winter management is blanketing. 
There are several types of blankets and there are several reasons to blanket or not to blanket your horse. Blanketing and shelters are definitely an investment for your horse. It's up to you to decide what kind of investment you would like to make for your horse. So some of the things about blanketing. Do I blanket or do I not blanket? Well, do you use your horse a lot in the winter? Do you think your horse deserves to stay as warm as you in the winter? Is your horse just livestock? How do you feel about your horse? That is one of the reasons you would blanket or not blanket. Okay, when you do and when you shouldn't. So blanketing for your horse, you should do only when it is below freezing. In this way, your horse is still able to grow a winter coat and therefore can, man can utilize that air insulation in their hair coat. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't blanket when it is above freezing? It depends. Do you want your horse to grow a winter hair coat or not? If you are showing and using your horse, you probably don't want them to grow a very long winter coat as it's harder for them to dry out and it, they look shaggy. In this case, you can blanket before, long before it gets um, below zero, below freezing and your horse will not grow as much of a winter coat because they are keeping warm. Two things that will trigger your horse to grow a winter coat, temperature and also the length of daylight. Once the days start getting short, your horse is going to start growing a new hair coat. But the temperatures will depend on how thick it can get. Okay. Um, I, when you shouldn't blanket your horse also is, are they used to it? You would maybe need to slowly adapt them to a blanket. You don't just want to throw a blanket on a horse that's never been blanketed before. This could cause a wreck. Um... Types of blankets. I have pictures here of several different kinds. The one up in the upper left is a sheet. This is for slightly cooler weather if you have this show horse like in the picture. Maybe you don't want him to get chilled and start to grow a little bit of a coat. So you put the sheet on to protect him from the wind, give him a little bit of body heat trappage, and he should stay nice and slick. In the picture with the mm -hmm horse and foal with the stars and stripes on. This is called a light blanket. It has a very thin layer of wool for trapping heat in the horse. It is not waterproof. It is generally for in a stable or when it is a nice day and your horse goes out, but it might be a little windy. Now on the bottom left, this is a full blown winter blanket. This blanket, as you can see, is a little shiny, which means it is most likely waterproof. This one also co comes with a neck rug that is an attachment to keep your horse's neck warm. And the tailgate in order to keep the horse's rump warm. His horses, as you know, will stand with their tail to the wind. This will block any wind going up through the rump and getting under your horse's blanket and keeping them warm. The blanket on the bottom right is called a stable blanket. You can tell this because it is quilted. These are generally not waterproof. They can come in several different weights from lightweight, medium to heavyweight. It just depends on how much fill is in there. Again, these trap air just like your horse's hair coat do. So blanket safety, again, you don't want to throw a blanket on a horse that's never had one before. You want to go slow and teach them that it's okay. You want to make sure that all the leg straps and belly straps and neck straps and everything are on securely. You don't want them dragging. You also don't want them too loose in order for a horse to get a leg through and end up getting into a big wreck. Uh, barbed wire fences and blankets do not mesh. They will get ripped. They will need to be sewn up. And as a blanket can be a considerable investment, you want to make sure that they are safe out in the pasture with them. So one of the myths about blankets is that if you blanket your horse, they're not going to grow a winter coat. Of course, I mentioned this a little bit before. However, I wanted to show you this picture. These are my personal horses. The black horse, as you can see, has a blanket on. And as he is 20 years old, he does get blanketed in the wintertime. 
The mare on the right is eight years old and obviously in a body condition of about an eight, so she does not get blanketed. She has ample ability to keep herself warm, whereas a 20-year-old horse has a little bit less body condition and needs a little extra help in keeping himself warm. Now, the horse, the picture of the horse on the right is the same black horse taken a few weeks later, and you can see that he does have an ample winter coat. Look at his flanks, look at his neck, and look at his face, and you can see where he is definitely a fuzzy boy. If you blanket below freezing temperatures, your horse will grow a winter coat. My horses don't get blanketed unless it is below freezing. The black horse gets blanketed at about 30 degrees and below. And the gray mare, if it is below 10 degrees, will get blanketed again because she has ample body condition and is much younger. Hoof care. So the basic thing about hoof care is that we want to keep our feet trimmed. We don't want them too long or to pancake out. This will interfere with bone growth in young horses. It also can lead to lameness in older horses if they are not kept in good shape. And you've all heard the old adage, no hoof, no horse. If your hoof is not in good shape, your horse is not going to be able to do the job that you give him. If your horse is tender-footed or you ride across rocky ground, it is a good idea to put shoes on. Or if you have a horse that tends to pancake out, sometimes putting a shoe on those hooves can help keep those hooves in better shape. Now it is up to you and your farrier to decide what type of hoof care your horse needs. Your farrier and you will know your horse much better than anyone else and should know how to take care of their feet. Hooves can tell a story. If your horse is not healthy, their hooves will be brittle, dry, cracked. Their uh, coronary band at where the hoof meets the foot will be dry and brittle, possibly cracking there as well. It might be flaky a little. It is important to note that you can pay attention to your horse's health through their hooves. If your horse has a ring around its hoof, depending on where it is located in the hoof, you can tell that your horse had some kind of traumatic event. Common ailments for our horses. Colic is one of the most common. The definition of colic is a bellyache. Colic can be in many different forms. You have gas colic, you can have twisted gut, you can just have impaction. There are many different types. However, the definition of colic is a bellyache. Symptoms of colic in your horse are going to be an increased heart rate. They will be sweating sometimes, they might kick at their bellies, they may swish their tails, they may turn around and look at their bellies. They may get down and roll, get back up, get down and roll. They may stand spread out with their hind legs way behind them. Any of these symptoms must tell you that there is something wrong with your horse. Now, treatments for colic. It could be as simple as getting your horse up, walking them around for a few hours, keeping feet away from them, pushing the water. You may need to give some banamine to control pain and inflammation, but treatments can also go as complicated as surgery to untwist the bowel of your horse. Now, prevention. Ample supply of clean, fresh water. Not too cold, not too hot. If in winter time your horse's water is prone to freezing, it is a good idea to get them a water heater in order to keep that water warm enough for them to want to drink. Just like you and I, when it is cold outside, we don't want to put ice cold water in our bellies as that lowers our body temperature from the inside. Same thing with drinking hot water. It is hard to keep your water cool in the summertime, however, changing it often will help keep the temperature of your water down. If your water is gross, your horse will not want to drink it, and therefore the fresh, clean supply of water is necessary. Another thing to keep to prevent your horses from colicking is to keep them on a strict deworming schedule. An overabundance of parasites can lead to colic in your horse because their intestines are not getting enough blood supply, or because there are so many of them in there that your horse may be impacting. Another type of impact of colic is impaction. In this case, 
these horses are eating so fast or so much that their food is not going through their system correctly or it is getting stuck in there because they're not having enough water in their guts to keep it moving. So things to keep in mind for impaction colics is keep your horse with ample supply of salt. Free choice is best. That way the horse can lick the salt. They will be thirsty and will continue to drink. Another good thing is if you feed your horse any kind of compacted feed such as hay cubes, it is best to water them down before you feed your horse. There is always water in the horse's belly. If you feed hay cubes without watering them down, the water in the horse's gut will allow them to expand. Once this happens, then your horse can impact from too much feed and not enough water in the guts. Same thing with alfalfa pellets and some pelleted feeds or cubed feeds uh, like the um, horse packers feed that people carry up in the mountains. A good owner will know what their horse looks like when they are normal. A good owner will know the horse's vital statistics before something happens. You should know their resting heart rate, their resting respiratory rate, their temperature on a good day, and you should be able to listen for gut sounds. If your horse is absent of gut sounds, then you know there is a problem. An increased heart rate is the number one symptom of something going on with your horse, whether it be an injury or colic or anything else. Know your horse's vitals at a good day. Another common ailment is laminitis. The definition of laminitis is inflammation of the lamina. As you can see in the picture on the right, you can see what's called the insensitive of lamina of the foot. When this hoof is actually attached to a horse's foot, they have what's called sensitive lamina that are on the inside that attach the hoof to the foot. The sensitive lamina have the blood supply and the nutrients that go to the hoof. Then the insensitive lamina are what hook to the sensitive lamina, kind of like cogs in a clock or a gear. They are interwoven and that is how the hoof is attached to your foot. Now what happens is, is that when your horse's lamina inflame due to say a starch overload from eating too much grass, then you would have these inflame and once they are inflamed, they swell and pull apart. This is extremely painful for your horse and it is necessary to get the swelling down immediately. Symptoms of laminitis include dog sitting where your horse would have their hind feet underneath of them to take the pressure off of the front feet, heat along the coronary band and in the hoof, your horse's reluctance to move, an increased heart rate, maybe increased respiratory rate and sweating as well. Treatments for laminitis are to soak the feet in as cold of water as you can possibly get, therefore decreasing the swelling in the lamina. Soak them as often and for as long as your horse will stand it. Other treatments provide uh, support for the coffin bone inside of the horse's foot. As you can see in the bottom left picture, this is called a lily pad, which provides coffin bone support. While your horse is not being soaked, his feet need to be wrapped either with a lily pad or on tough insulation styrofoam that will comfort and support the coffin bone of your horse. Prevention for laminitis. Do not let your horse get in the grain bed and eat as much as he wants. This causes a starch overload. The starch is then fermented in the hindgut or the cecum of the horse and in this way then produces lactic acid which by gravity travels to the horse's feet causing the inflammation of the lamina. Another thing that can cause laminitis in your horse is too much concussion from hard services. So if you're riding your horse a lot, you need to make sure that the footing is good. A good owner will know what his horse looks like on a good day. Again, what his normal stance is. A good horse owner will again know those vital statistics to know if something is wrong. A good horse owner will also know the attitude of his horse on a good day so that if anything changes, they will know right away. You will also know 
what the normal temperature of your horse's foot feels like. And another way to tell if your horse is injured is by the digital pulses in their feet. So a good horse owner will know what the digital pulses feel like before he is injured. When he is injured with laminitis or uh, foot injury, those digital pulses will increase and you will feel them much easier. The digital pulses are felt on the back side, just on the bottom of the fetlock. You would use your forefinger and your thumb to feel on either side. You don't use much pressure and you would feel for the pulse through these arteries. Founder, the definition of founder, is chronic inflammation of the lamina. Where laminitis is not for a long time, laminitis happens once, it is inflamed, it is painful, it is quick. You can definitely get those the inflammation down, your horse can recover. Founder is where the inflammation lasts for days and days and days and won't go away, thus disrupting the blood flow and separating the lamina in the horse's hoof. This is a chronic condition. This is also treatable but never curable. The symptoms of this will be exactly as for laminitis, only these symptoms will continue for more than just a few days. Treatments for this is cough and bone support, special shoeing as you can see in the picture, your, your farrier and your veterinarian are their best sources for treating a horse with founder. Prevention. Again, do not let your horse get into the grain bin and eat as much as he wants. Maybe limit your horse to the amount of time he has on fresh green grass. This will go with laminitis as well. Fresh green grass in the spring has high amounts of carbohydrates, which again are fermented in the hindgut and can lead to founder and laminitis. Changing your horse's feed slowly will help decrease the chance of laminitis and founder. And your good horse owner will know how to take care of their horse. If the horse is feeling uncomfortable, they will be able to gauge the horse's attitude and know. And they will know if it is inhumane to keep that horse going or if they should put them down due to the pain in their feet. Another common ailment is choke. This is caused from horses eating too fast and getting things stuck into their esoph esophagus. So the definition of choke is that with a human getting something stuck in the throat or esophagus and not able to clear it. The symptoms would be having feed come back through the nasal passages as with the picture in the left. Uh, maybe a cough from your horse trying to move things up. Depression inability or unwillingness to eat. Uh, treatments for this generally can include taking the feed away and passing an NG tube as with the picture on the right to get the blockage stuck. Now if your horse is pr has choked once he is prone to choke again. Things to do to keep your horse from choking if he is what you call a bullet eater or he likes to inhale his feed Put some rocks or balls in with his feet and make him slow down and have to get around those things. Uh, he has to work harder to get his feed. Um, maybe feed them smaller, uh, smaller meals at more often, a greater frequency. And a good horse owner will know, again, the horse's attitude if he's not feeling right. Uh, if he's coughing a lot, he'll know that that is a choke or not something to do with say, o C COPD in their horse. You will be able to notice if there is something coming at your horse's nose, and you will know when it is time to call your veterinarian.